Today we will have a very short lecture showing example of examples of transverse stresses in beams and uh, the impact of transverse stresses on the plastic yielding. So we have very little new theory today and we'll focus uh, the last weeks here on doing a lot of uh, problems. Uh, I have uploaded two old exam sets with solutions by now and I will upload more exam sets and the idea here the last few weeks before the exam is really to focus on doing exercises or problems uh, so you get practice before the written exam which is on 18th of May. Please remember to complete the course evaluation. A few people have already done so. Uh, let me just hear. So last day is tomorrow. So please take uh, just a few minutes it takes to uh, fill out the course evaluation so we can uh, improve the uh, the course or uh, make some changes or please come with your input to what we can do better in this course. All right, so the semester schedule, we have the very end here, uh, week 12. So as written here, uh, we are still dealing with the transfer stresses um, and as said, the impact on plastic yielding. So next week, uh, there will be no new theory. Uh, I will do some repetition exercises and I will uh, advise you to get me some uh, wishes for specific problems, specific exercises that we have done during the uh, during the year that I can take up and show as uh, repetition exercises. So go through the old problems and take a look at what has been the most difficult and uh, write me an email uh, and I will take that up as a specific uh, uh, example uh, to show here. I will also write out an, uh, a notification about this uh, later th this week. So let's just uh, repeat a little bit what we did last week. So last week was mainly about shear stresses. Uh, so uh, we saw two specific examples of shear stresses. One were due to the transverse loads. So if we have a transverse load V, as we see here on the beam. Uh, then uh, that, of course, comes from or is associated with a distribution of transfer stresses. So it's not something that we will do a lot on this uh, in this course because, uh, well, in reality, it's a little bit complicated and depends very much on the specific cross-section that we look at. So as we saw last week, uh, the very first and simple approximation to finding the stress distribution and the amplitude of the stresses when we have shear loads or shear forces is just to have a uniform distribution. But it can be shown that in reality, we have a parabolic stress distribution and we have here the formula uh, for the uh, parabolic stress distribution for a rectangular cross section. We will see a little bit more of that today, uh, but that's basically one of the topics from last week. And then the main part was dealing with transfer stresses coming from torsion. Uh, and we also saw formulas that helped us to compute the uh, transfer stresses that when we have a torsional moment applying on a circular shaft. In, in the case where we have a rectangular or a, a cross section of another uh, shape, it will be more complicated to do torsion. So we just concentrated on the circular shafts. And then finally, we did a few problems dealing with torsion. And uh, this was a problem that I did in the slides. Uh, so uh, the main issue here was when we have a connected structure as we see here was to identify all the different contributions that we actually have to the deflection and to the forces acting on the system. So in this case we could see that uh, when we apply the external load F on the handle, on the end of the handle, then in turn it means that on the circular uh, shaft we will have both a transverse uh, force upwards and we will also have a torsional moment. And then you did a few exercises in the problem session, also dealing with torsion and also a um, exercise uh, that was a bit of a repetition on how to uh, deal with statically indeterminate uh, problems. So as said, we will again 
uh, just look at a few examples of shear stresses uh, in, in this uh, lecture and uh, it will not be uh, very uh, in depth but just uh, here showing again the formula uh, and the, the main point here is maybe not the formula itself because it's just a, a little bit of a repetition of what we did last time that when we have uh, a shear load when we want to compute the shear stresses associated with this shear load it really depends very much on the specific uh, geometry of the cross section and for the rectangular case here we see in detail it's a copy from the book uh, these figures uh, how we work out the specific formula which we indeed can recognize as this uh, parabolic uh, stress distribution over the cross section um, you can say what is important when we talk about uh, well, why do we want to find the shear stresses well we we want to get an account of uh, the maximum stresses in the beam to find out if uh, if the beam fails or if it's okay with the load that's acting on it. So we are really much interested in uh, finding the maximum shear stress. And we can see here from the formula, we find a very uh, simple uh, formula for the maximum shear stress. And that amounts to 1.5 or 3 halves of the uh, shear load and then divided by the cross-sectional area. So that's, of course, that gives an extra, you can say 50% compared to if we had just assumed that uh, we had a uniform stress distribution, then we would have had that the maximum shear stress would just have been V over A. So having the exact and correct formula allows us to identify that we actually have maximum shear stresses that are a bit uh, higher than what we would have had if we had used the simplified theory. Uh, but as said, uh, it's very much dependent on the specific cross section. For instance, if we look at if you look at the figure to the left, figure A for 36A, if we have like this uh, thin wall cross section which has the specific dimensions here, we have the height uh, 2A, we have the width A, and then we have the thickness T. So these are the dimensions here. Then we can also, by doing equilibrium equations, work out a specific distribution of the stresses uh, along uh, the thin wall section as also indicated in the figure and we get this uh, specific formula that we can use to identify uh, the stress distribution again we can see that the maximum stress occurs in the uh, middle of the cross section so when z is equal to zero and we can specifically uh, identify the maximum shear stress uh, that we get here we can also see that in the upper parts, uh, let me just see here. Now we can see that in the upper parts of the cross section uh, and in the lower part, we actually have stresses in the other direction. And that's of course due to the fact that we need to ensure that we have an equilibrium at the corners. So the uh, shear stresses in the set direction uh, will also lead to shear stresses in the Y direction in this case. Again, very much specific on the cross section that we're looking at. A final example is a double or an I-beam profile where we can here see the same uh, effect that we have where the main shear stresses are in the, uh, the vertical uh, part of the cross section here, but due to equilibrium uh, we get, and this is actually can be specifically uh, written out the equilibrium conditions meaning that we also in the top part of our cross section will have shear stresses in the other direction here. But the maximum shear stress is again found, as we can see here, identified in the middle uh, of our vertical part of our cross section. So all of this is really specific to uh, shear stresses originating in uh, shear loads. Uh, but as we also mentioned uh, last week, when we're talking about shear stresses, we're usually focusing on the shear stresses that comes from torsion because they usually give the largest contributions to the stresses. And that leads me to the next point, which is actually the main point of today. Uh, so we, you can ask, why are we at all looking at these stresses? We have looked a lot on normal stresses coming from normal forces and coming from bending. And now we have looked at shear stresses coming from shear loads, well, not to a great extent, but also mainly coming from torsion. So why are we looking at all these stresses? It's of course that we want to make sure that the load that we put on our structure is not too big so that we get a failure of the material. So remember, we talked about it in, the pre in some previous uh, weeks, uh, not a lot, but we did talk about that the 
the failure criteria is usually uh well it could be buckling but more usually it's like uh the the plastic limit or the plastic yielding so if our stress in our structure becomes too large then we will have plastic yielding meaning we go from elastic behavior to plastic behavior and that's usually something you want to avoid so therefore we want in practice to be to make sure that our stresses do not exceed uh, the allowable stress which is the plastic uh, strain or plastic stress limit now the difficulty come now in well if we both have normal stresses and we also have shear stresses which type of stress is then important for uh, what is our sigma e here how do we actually uh, measure an equivalent stress that we need to control and there are certain uh, models out there and we use here the basic uh, model that we have written up here so we of course need to identify that both normal stresses which we then here have in a two-dimensional case so normal stresses sigma y and sigma x but also shear stresses here tau xy and tau xy here they all contribute in some way to the stress level of our structure and as i said several models are out there but this is one of the more popular models that we can see here specific uh, model for how these different types of stresses contribute to the effective stress and that's why we call it sigma e so it will be the a measure of the effective stress in our structure so this is of course uh, it has been uh, derived in in the literature and it has been uh, it's, it's sort of an empirical model but also verified by experiments that this is a good model for predicting the effective stress now when it comes to our cases where we have beams and we have normal stresses and we have shear stresses usually we boils down to this simple formula that for instance if we have some shear stresses tau coming from either torsion or transverse loads this will go into this quantity here and if we have normal stresses come from uh, normal forces and bending then this goes into this uh, form uh, part here of the formula and then we can quite easily predict uh, the effective stress in our um, in our structure yes so this is the main thing uh, if we have both transfer stresses normal stresses then we can easily or quite easily compute the effective stress that we then have to make sure is below the yield stress of our material. With this uh, very few words, uh, we can then actually just go on with solving our exercises. Today there are three exercises. Uh, one is um, continuing with the torsion example. So it's a little bit similar to what we did last time. The load is a bit different. So this will help you again uh, well using the torsion formulas but also identifying the different contributions to deformations in structures that are put up uh, of different parts like this and then we again have a example to the right here where we have a statically indeterminate uh, problem that you need to solve um, as the final words here before we go to the problem session later on uh, let me just have a few words about assignment two. So I, for those people who handed in their assignment, I have handed back feedback. Uh, and generally, I will say that uh, while the quality of the uh, the answers are quite good, uh, most people had uh, actually not many problems with many parts of the problem. But there's one point which actually I think nobody uh, got the very correct answer for the uh, for that problem and then one uh, the point of uh, computing the deflection of the point c so the point c is where the load p is acting so uh most people identified the correct uh, contributions to the bending uh, of our structure from b to c so let me just repeat we have a here we have b here so the beam from B to C is, of course, bending due to the load P, but also due to the distributed load Q. And uh, most people successfully identified the contributions to the bending from this part. Many people also uh, realized that since we had a vertical uh, the, uh, displacement of our point B, this should also be added. But in the specific case where we analyzed uh, 
the structure for p equal to q, this would of course amount to zero. But in general, of course, this needs to be accounted for. If we have a vertical moment or a movement of point B, this directly reflects, of course, also in point C. The one thing that uh, like all people uh, fail to realize, uh, and it's not a surprise because at this point we didn't really focus a lot on these connected structures. Uh, so I guess if you had done the rotation or the uh, torsion exercises before this, you would have been more, it would have been more easy to identify that of course, that when we have bending of our beam from A to B, so we can see that here on the right figure, then due to the fact that we have a right angle up here at point B, then of course we also get a rigid body rotation of our uh, beam from B to C. So due to the fact just that we are rotating, then we get what we call a deflection due to rotation here. You can see that directly from the figure. So even if our beam BC had been completely rigid, then we would still have had a vertical deflection of our point C just due to the rotation at B. Uh, so uh, the rotation here, once we have found the angle of rotation, which we can find from beam AB using um, uh, elementary cases, then we can directly write up the deflection due to rotation. So in general, uh, the complete deflection of our point C will be a sum of three parts, where one of them, the last one here, is for this specific choice of loads equal to zero. Please note that uh, the solution has been uploaded uh, in the assignment, so you can check out the uh, completely correct solution for this problem. As I said, this is it for today. Very little theory. We will focus on doing the exercises and more exam problems will be uploaded uh, in the coming week here. Just as a final note about the exam, uh, a few people have asked uh, what will the exam uh, be like when we are located abroad and not in Denmark. So I can say that for all people, either if you are abroad or if you are situated in Denmark, the conditions are the same. It will be an online exam that you can take at home and you should be able to find the relevant information at Insight. Otherwise, they will definitely come shortly. Thank you.